Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have you with us. I'm Candace Boothby. I'm the Noonan Coweta Chamber President and CEO, and we are doing these back to business sessions. We record them and we're building our video library and then sending these out to our members. Um, but this is a special treat today. I had the opportunity to hear our speaker a few weeks ago at our Regional Business Coalition meeting, took copious notes, um, shared a lot of the sound bites with our board and other groups, and um, it was just great information. And so we are delighted to have Tom Cunningham joining us today. He's a senior VP and chief economist with the Atlanta Chamber. He's been there about five years. And uh, Tom, you can share just a little bit more about yourself. But um, I know from uh, for the names that I'm seeing on the screen, you guys are very interested in this topic and happy for you to join us. And Tom, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you so you can go ahead. And get, I will say one thing, uh, the chat room is um, activated. So so people can use that to ask questions. And I guess Susan can answer this. If anybody wants to do a, a voice question, we can offer that opportunity at the end as well. So Tom, welcome. We are delighted to have you joining us and to look forward to some great information. Well, thanks. Thank you for having me. And I'll, I'll uh, let either you or Susan handle the uh, questions as they, as they come up as you see fit. Um, hi, it's, it's a Pleasure talking to all of you. Um, by way of background, I'm, I'm Tom Cunningham, Chief Economist at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Um, I spent my adult life at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta doing monetary policy and working my way up through the research department ranks. Um, and I came to Atlanta uh, having finished up my PhD at Columbia and uh, kind of got drafted by the Atlanta Fed and, and uh, have had a great time here since then. So what I'm going to do today is talk about the economic outlook and its risks. And this is a really interesting time to be a macroeconomist, just because, you know, things are so distorted um, from, from where they kind of normally are. Um, in general, I don't like using PowerPoint slides just because I think they can distract from the larger message. But now that I think that's particularly important. Um, one, of the, one of the more important things we typically talk about is job creation nationally. Um, and if, if you look at that slide right now, you know, in a typical month we get, I don't know, 100, 200,000 jobs nationally, something like that, bouncing around. Um, you know, a strong month, a little more. Um, and, and so if you try and plot that over time, what you see now, it's just an absolutely flat line from whenever you start the, the process until about two months ago when we lost 20 million jobs. So you have this, this relatively flat line, even though it includes, you know, serious booms and serious recessions. Um, it, it's all wiped out by the magnitude of what's happening now. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that this recession is going to have to be um, necessarily as bad as the 2008 one, but that was both deep and long. This one, in terms of its initial depth, is, is just unprecedented in our lifetime. Um, Unprecedented in our lifetime is actually a, a really good theme here, because one of the things um, that, you know, just because we're human, we, we try and, and fit uh, what we're experiencing now in with, with what we've experienced in the past. And I think for a variety of reasons, that might be a fairly misleading thing to do, and we need to be really careful about that. Um, you know, this, in, in most recessions, in fact, in, in all recessions in the post-war period, what, what's gone on is that some sector um, has sort of got overextended, or maybe several sectors, uh, it's gotten overextended. Uh, there's been some sort of external shock or something, and, um, you know, things have kind of slowed down dramatically in, in one or more sectors. Uh, people generically have started to get scared about their income going forward, and so they cut back on consumption. 
And, you know, consumption drives the U.S. economy. And so declines in consumer spending uh, kind of create a self-fulfilling um, recession, that if you come to expect a recession, you, you get one because people start saving in anticipation of it and, and uh, you know, things go south from there. And so typically what policymakers have to do is try and figure out how to get people back spending. That is, you know, how do you get people back in the offices or back in the factories, back in the restaurants or, or stores or whatever. This experience is pretty much exactly the opposite of that. That we were in an extremely healthy economy. Um, I might even say booming, but, but certainly a thriving um, economy up until the middle of March. And, and starting in the middle of March, um, this pandemic kind of overwhelmed us. And, and this is what the important point here is, people had the means and the motive to continue going into the office and continuing going into stores and restaurants, but they couldn't because of the public health problem. And that set us up for this economic disruption. And that just is entirely different than uh, recessions that we have had in the past. And that puts things like policy issues in, in a very different perspective. That, you know, if you think about kind of typical recessions or, or even short-term disruptions, if there's a natural disaster, and this clearly is a natural disaster, it's just really global in scope, um, most natural disasters that we have dealt with in the past, the way you recover from them is with, um, you know, transfer payments to cover the economic losses and some sort of bridge loan scheme to uh, make sure that, that businesses can continue to survive. So, you know, you have a hurricane come through a particular area and it shuts everything down. But then about a week later, things start to open up again and things won't return to normal for a while, but you have a pretty good idea that you could do a bridge loan of some kind for whatever, a year or two. Um, and, and that's an appropriate response for the problem. The issue this time around is that if you're going to do some sort of bridge financing, you know, over the course of, of the pandemic, you, you don't know how long to build the bridge for, that the pandemic is, is not, still in existence. Um, and until the actual public health problem gets resolved, it doesn't have to be solved, um, but we do have to kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, issues about continuing economic stimulus and, and, you know, bridging to provide support during the crisis are really problematic. Uh, because you just don't know how long these, these um, you know, stimulus and, and transitory support programs have to be in place for. That again, once we have a, a clear understanding of how this is going to, to play out and, and eventually come to an end, um, kind of more traditional stimulus methods and, and you know, means of, of getting the economy going again are um, much easier to kind of roll out um, they certainly will have to be on a large scale, to be sure. But, but the fundamental problem here is, is wildly different than anything that we've seen in our lifetime. Um, and again, I think we have to be careful about how we, how we kind of interpret um, a lot of what we're experiencing uh, and, and make sure that we don't spend too much time mapping it into things that we've experienced in the past. So I think that that's probably um, fairly misleading. So just to kind of go through the numbers a little bit, I, I realize this can be a little bit tedious, but um, it, it's useful for thinking about uh, Georgia and, and the Atlanta metro area. Um, you know, we were doing extremely well that the 29 county um, metro Atlanta MSA um, had been outperforming the nation in, in terms of growth for, we've been doing it for decades, and, and actually we still are. Um, 
And, and as a consequence of that, the metro Atlanta area was both very large and very diverse, and, and it still is. Um, a lot of people who are, who are in metro Atlanta and have been here for a while, I think, underappreciate just how large the metro economy is. That if we were an economy unto ourselves, uh, we would be bigger than the economy of Norway. Uh, we would be almost with the United Arab Emirates. Um, Georgia is about a little bit bigger than Austria overall. Um, we're very large. We're also very diverse. Um, and that's something that has really stood Atlanta well in the past, and I believe stands as well now. That if you think about what's driving the, the metro Atlanta area forward, there isn't one particular industry. I mean, we have some hot industries to be sure, uh, but when you think about what's really, you know, at the core of our economy, there isn't a particular industry that we're, that we're overly dependent on. I mean, to be sure, we've got an awful lot of air transit. Um, we've got an awful lot of hospitality, but, you know, they're still small in the larger scheme of the overall metro economy. Um, I, I'll talk about these a little bit later, but as compared to some of our competitor cities, like, Dallas or, or Charlotte, uh, where they're dependent upon, you know, oil and, and, and banking. Um, Atlanta doesn't have that, that kind of dependency. It makes it tough for people in, in chambers of commerce to sell the area because we're not dependent on one thing. Um, you know, we're, we're diverse and, and that's, that's a good thing, um, but it's hard to, to encapsulate into a, a nice little phrase to, to attract other industries. On the other hand, the, the depth of our diversity and the size of our diversity um, serves us well in terms of risk minimization. That if you're in a relatively um, large and diverse economy, um, the, the resilience can be much larger because there, there just isn't any one sector that, that's going to uh, kind of take out the, all the others all at once. We've seen this play out um, in, in the calamity associated with the beginning of the pandemic that, you know, we were doing okay until March and, and that, you know, started to shut everything down in a big way. And so in the April unemployment numbers, we saw, you know, the nation surge from what was functionally close to full employment uh, to almost 15% unemployment, 14.7% um, in terms of headline unemployment. That kind of, of that, that level of unemployment, 14.7%, is higher than anything that we saw during the Great Recession. Um, and so, you know, we're in a kind of a bigger hole than we were in then. But a more important thing is that we got there in pretty much one month, that when you look at the Great Recession in, in you know, 2008 to 2010, um, we really didn't see peak unemployment um, until about a year into the recession. That um, while it was a calamitous time, um, the unemployment rate peaked out a little over 10%, but it took uh, about a year to get there, over a year to get there um, in terms of the economy slowing down. And again, that's just something that didn't happen this time. We, we, we really did hit a wall. Now, the wall that Georgia hit was not as severe as the nation overall, that we were all tracking you know, in the you know, mid to, to upper 3% unemployment range, the US shot up to 147 um, Georgia's unemployment rate shot up to 12.6%. So it's so a little under, um, in fact, more than a little under uh, the national uh, numbers. It appears that the initial response sort of overshot what was necessary. That, you know, we did have this big shutdown and an enormous number of people lost their jobs. But there was then an immediate um, shuffling or reshuffling of the labor market. Some people returned to the jobs that they'd held previously and a whole lot of others um, gained work elsewhere. 
And so pretty much after the, the first month or so of, of, you know, real, real shutdown, hard shutdown in the economy, um, the unemployment rate started to recover. Um, and Georgia's unemployment rate recovered at a, at a better clip than the nation overall, that the nation, you know, eventually it's now down to just a little bit over 10% unemployment. Um, Georgia's down to 7.6% unemployment. Um, we have been doing better than the nation in, in terms of our recovery. And again, I think most of that is attributable to the, the depth of diversity in our economy that promotes a, a, a clear resilience. And I think that's, that's kind of, again, an important and somewhat reassuring thing going forward. Um, our competitor states were a little less resilient coming out of the shoot. And when we look around, I mean, Florida in particular, um, it was struggling last month. Um, you know, things, things actually, their unemployment rate uh, ticked up um, 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 almost a percentage point last month. And then that was unhealthy as a consequence of, of the pandemic, uh, you know, providing greater economic disruption. Uh, but, but we've continued to do relatively well. Uh, particularly in, the, in these kind of, um, you know, broader measures of labor market um, metrics. A much more narrow interest uh, measure, and this is something that, um, you know, we're, we're getting down in, in, in nerd land here, but, it, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, a very high frequency measure of, of labor market performance are the weekly unemployment numbers that, that come out from the Department of Labor in, in, in DC. Um, we, we've seen, you know, 100 million plus people uh, lose their jobs over the course of the pandemic. But an important thing is that after the initial surge in the number of people displaced, on net, the level of hiring has consistently been higher than the number of people losing their jobs. And, and the way you see this is by looking at the number of people that continue to re receive unemployment compensation. That you, you know, you lose your job, you apply for unemployment compensation, you know, hopefully you get it, hopefully there's nothing, no problem with your, your application or whatever. Um, but then if you get a job, you stop getting unemployment compensation. And so right after the shutdown, a major shutdown um, in, in mid-March, we had over 20 million people receiving unemployment compensation on a weekly basis. And even though the number of, of people that are uh, filing for unemployment compensation on a weekly basis has been with, with one recent week's exception, over a million people a week who have lost their jobs, the number of people continuing to receive unemployment compensation has, has been dropping fairly steadily. Um, and so now the number of people that are actually continuing to get unemployment compensation is just over 15 million, which means that even though in a week we're seeing you know, a little over a million people um, that have lost their job, it's the case that the economy has taken up um, about a million and a half people uh, that week in, in terms of, of um, hiring. So the pace of hiring is out, outpacing uh, the, the pace of layoffs. Um, that, that's healthy. We're in a very deep hole to be sure and, and have to get ourselves out of that. And that's gonna take some time. But, but the underlying high frequency data is, is pretty good. Georgia looks particularly good in, in that uh, metric. That when you look at the breakdown of new unemployment claims by state, um, the number of claims coming in by state has been falling in Georgia pretty consistently since we had the initial disruption. And in fact, for the last month, Georgia has been one of the top five states among all the states in terms of its decline in the number of, of unemployment claims. So even though we're continuing to see um, 
you know, continued disruption in the, the labor markets, and, and that certainly is not a lot of fun. Um, Georgia's economy seems to be doing relatively well compared to the other states. Um, and again, I, I attribute a lot of that to the resilience and, and diversity um, of, of the metro economy. Okay, so now let's, let's turn a little bit and, and look forward. Um, usually when you do economic forecasting, the further out you look, the more uncertain things get. And oddly, that doesn't seem to be the case right now that right now the real uncertainty is all in the short run and it's all about how the pandemic is going to play out and what kind of you know twists and turns the the disease is going to take but we're fairly confident that over the next couple of years uh the this uh will will get reined in um and and then we'll be back on a, on a what is potentially, a, again, a fairly healthy growth path, that you get long-term economic growth by increases in the workforce and by making the worse workforce more productive through investment and innovation. Well, well none of those fundamentals have really been changed. Um, you know, once we get out of this pandemic, the, the fundamentals that were serving us very well going into the pandemic um, are, are largely unchanged and I think will continue to serve us well on, on the other side of the pandemic as well. And, and that speaks well for Georgia as well because we have been doing uh, comparatively extremely well. One of the things the pandemic is doing, however, that, that I think is kind of important is not so much reshaping the future, but bringing a lot of the future forward. Um, I think the, uh, an easy place to start with is, is this meeting that we're attending right now, that it's not in person, obviously, it's a Zoom meeting. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody that has worked in an office has kind of always dreamed about is working remotely, either from home or more often, let's face it, from the beach. That, you know, man, we'd all love to be able to do our job, you know, wherever in some you know, pastoral or, or seaside setting. Um, that was something that we were moving towards and making some somewhat serious investments in. Um, but in mid-March, uh, the switch got turned and we all worked remotely. About a third of the workforce um, ended up working remotely immediately after uh, the, the pandemic shutdown. Um, we're not going to go back to what we were doing in the past that you know we certainly will see more people return to office environments particularly in, in you know more idiosyncratic professions some more than others but kind of across the board the overall intensity of, of office use in in the economy is, is going to go down um, you know we just aren't going to need as much office space per unit of GDP as we have in the past. Um, that doesn't mean that, that office um, you know, towers are going to be abandoned or anything far from it. Uh, that that you know, the economy is going to continue to grow. But the idea that it's going to be an office-fueled, um, you know, or an office-dominated future of, of white-collar employment um, really is going to be called into question that, that that's uh, just something that, you know, people have gotten used to kind of working at home and working remotely and everybody's figured out how to do it. There are enormous economies associated with uh, not traveling and, and, you know, holding meetings um, kind of through, through the internet. Um, and it's very unlikely that, that those efficiencies and economies are going to be given up um, easily. Not that a lot of them aren't going to go away. I mean, to be sure, we miss the, you know, the social hours, the happy hours after work, um, that, that, you know, the, the gatherings that, that, that the chamber engages in, in, in a kind of routine basis on just for social things. Uh, th those aren't going to go away. Um, but in terms of their relative importance of, in the economy, it's clear that 
that kind of fundamentally, particularly for white collar employment, uh, what had been kind of emerging as a longer term trend has suddenly appeared and, and isn't gonna go away. Um, and another one of those longer term trends that, that is going to be something that we're gonna to have to grapple with um, is the problem of retail that you know we've known for a long time that kind of small store retailers without an online presence um, had a very difficult business model that that uh, was going to be difficult to sustain and this this shutdown has just made that all the more dramatic um, you know how how small retailers again without online uh, uh, clients are, are going to manage is, is difficult. And that has implications for things like Main Street retail. Uh, the people that own the buildings um, are, are going to have to think about you know, kind of how to repurpose um, a, a lot of existing um, space where the, the kind of underlying business model uh, has been kind of permanently disrupted by this. And, and that's gonna be a problem going forward. There's, there's not a, a nice way out of that. On the other hand, um, you know, there's, there's some real positives here that you know, as we see you know, employment surge in certain industries, uh, the, the commercial real estate needed to support that is, is an extremely high demand now too. We're certainly seeing that in logistics the warehouse and, and distribution space is, is being constructed rapidly. And, and there seems to be a, certainly an excess demand at the moment for, for any kind of logistics related space. It's also true for, for employment, that the surge in, in uh, logistics, and this is not just low skill or, or middle skill um, employees, but, but also kind of the digital side of, of logistics management and supply chain management. Um, is, is seeing enormous growth, and, and that's where a major strength in hiring is occurring. It's also the case associated with logistics that a lot of manufacturing is, is changing in the long run and, and in a fairly permanent way. Um, manufacturers are re-examining their supply chains and, and doing so in a fairly serious way that you know, a lot of manufacturing went offshore because of labor cost differentials. Um, and you know, that's something that you have to manage and it takes a little bit more to manage it and presumably that's offset by, by labor savings. But, but now we're looking at a global pandemic and supply chain reliability is a real issue. And you know, it may be that you, know, you have, uh, as a manufacturer, three or four foreign sources for a particular intermediate good input, but it may be that those three or four uh, foreign suppliers are themselves all reliant on a single source, you know, kind of further up the line you know, on the supply chain. And re-examining that process and, and understanding what exactly the real risks are um, is leading to a lot of, of um, re-examination of the overall manufacturing philosophy. And now a lot of onshoring of, of manufacturing that it's not necessarily going to take place in the US, although much of it is, um, but uncertainties associated with, with supply chain management uh, suggests that, that relocating uh, firms into um, the US makes loads of sense. An enormous amount of, of manufacturing has seen, has, has been really where the, the major gains in productivity has been taking place. And so, you know, what we are seeing in the US in particular is an onshoring of um, manufacturing processes that are extremely highly um, uh, mechanized, automated, that, you know, capital, the interest rates are, are extremely low, energy prices are relatively low here, um, and kind of top shelf technical talent, the kind that you need to run a really high end um, automated manufacturing plant are, are readily available here. 
And so suddenly cost advantages uh, look pretty favorable for the U.S. and combine that with the risks of an uncertain uh, supply chain and, and potential disruptions there. Um, and, and suddenly it's kind of understandable that you're seeing sort of um, a resurgence in manufacturing uh, industrial space uh, construction. That a lot of this stuff, again, it makes sense to bring it back on shore because the cost differentials are not that great um, when uh, labor is a, a much smaller segment of the overall cost. Um, and, and the costs associated with uncertainty are, are huge. So yeah, again, we're, we're seeing a sorting going on um, in, in manufacturing that is uh, in the not too long run going to benefit the, the US in particular and North America generally. Um, beyond that, uh, we have recovered enough that we can start saying some things with some certainty about um, some segments of the economy. In particular, uh, state and local government. State and local government's taking an enormous hit, but state and local governments also don't have the, the ability to run deficits that the, the federal government has. And so, for example, in the state of Georgia, you saw some, some fairly serious cutbacks associated with the decline in revenues. Um, and that's something that is going to ultimately be driven by economic recovery forces. Again, I think Georgia is better poised than other states, um, but this is going to be a source of headwinds for um, recoveries in, in across states. That, that those states that are particularly dependent on, upon some particular industry for their revenue um, are maybe struggling for a while. Uh, one can easily think of, of uh, um, you know, policymakers in the state of Texas that have to struggle with a dramatic decline in their oil severance tax revenue uh, that is unlikely to recover in the near term. Um, you know, the kind of municipal employees, state and local government, state and local education um, are going to be faced with a much longer um, set of problems than, than are going to be in existence here. I think again that that bodes well for, for Georgia in a relative sense. Uh, but again, in the meantime, we're, we're, we're in kind of a hole here. Um, certainly Congress is aware of the hole that state and local governments are in um, and I, I think it's fairly likely that we will see some state and local government relief going forward uh, beyond the first round associated with the CARES Act. Um, but again, all of that is really up in the air and very uncertain um, because of, of problems associated with, with the pandemic. Okay, so I planned on talking about half an hour and, and doing questions, and that's exactly what's happened. Um, so I'll shut up and, and see what kind of questions people have. Um, again, I, I think the, the fundamental message here is that um, kind of the, the, the investments that the, the sovereign bodies associated with, with Georgia have made in making this a really good place to do business are helping us in a relative sense uh, compared to others in, in this, uh, you know, really serious disruption. Um, but, but we are still in a relatively deep hole and it's going to take some time for us to, uh, to work our way out. It's not the most uplifting of messages, I know, um, but I, I think it's good to be fairly realistic about where we are and uh, reasonably optimistic about where we are um, in the not too distant future uh, as, as uh, things go forward. So with all that in mind, um, I'll, I'll shut up and do questions. Um, Tom, this is Susan here and yeah, I will I'll share you with you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I will share with you a question that has been posted um, in a chat box to a message to me. Um, 
the convention and trade show industry has seen huge losses similar to film and television industry. Um, can you comment as to how these losses of income and relative spending impact city and state income, tax income that is? Um, tax yeah. Revenue. Yeah, negatively and, and really, uh. really fairly bad. Um, Atlanta, Atlanta is kind of interesting in its hospitality that, that we do an awful lot of conventions and we have lost an awful lot of money associated with that. Um, in the larger scheme of our economy, our hospitality sector is large, but not wildly so. Um, it's, it's bigger than, than some other, uh, than, than sort of metro averages, but it's not bigger than in a proportionate sense than, than Orlando or Nashville um, or, or somebody like Las Vegas. It's very visible because it's all concentrated in a particular area, kind of the campus of, around the, the downtown athletic facilities is, and the World Congress Center um, was intentionally set up to, to be an ideal location for large sporting events and large locations. And so when they're not there, you see them. And that's that. That's a big hole, and and that is you know not it's not at all clear how that that's going to come back. Um, mm, that was actually going to be my follow up question, a very unfair question, but a follow up question nonetheless, which is when do we predict a rebound for you know hospitality and film and television trade shows, et cetera? Okay, well, pretty much well, can't. Yeah, film actually is kind of interesting. And again, that is um, a function of kind of the way the industry has developed here. That Pinewood Studios is resuming operations. Um, and, and they're, you know, one of the major players in, in film production in, in the state. They're able to do that because they have a big campus. Um, and so they bring people in uh, from around the world quarantine them as appropriate at you know lodging facilities nearby and then they're they're in a bubble and so people work um you know people are, are restarting work on on filming stuff um mm -hmm. but it is in a very contained environment and it evidently it's working fairly well um okay you, you can't do that with convention activity that, that right. just doesn't work. And until, again, we, we really get, um, you know, a viable and credible um, solution to, to, to the, the COVID problem, we've got a problem. And, and mm -hmm. we are not alone. Um, you know, Orlando yeah. and, and Las Vegas and, and uh, Nashville are all um, in, in serious difficulties too. Mm -hmm. And an interesting comment on that on that note that I see pop up here is uh, uh, having entertainment in a bubble doesn't do a lot for the local economy. Um, uh, speaking to Pinewood operating in this silo, so to speak. Yeah, although they do bring in an awful lot of, of uh, local vendors. Um, so it, it's not um, it, it's not it's not a bubble bubble in that sense that, okay. you know, they, you know, there, there are, you know, technical people, uh, post-production people, um, you know, all kinds of vendors that need to routinely supply stuff. They're doing it in, you know, an awkward way, but you mm -hmm. know, one of the, one of the biggest home depots there is, is located inside yeah. Pinewood studios. Um, right. and, and that has not let up. Um, you know, and, and all of the contract suppliers associated with, with uh, supporting the activity um, are, are getting back in shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, on a similar note, um, would you agree that, or, or what is your thought on two, basically two thirds of the economy as service based makes for a more difficult recovery? Um, no. I don't think so. I, I think it's uh, a sign of a relatively wealthy economy that um, 
you know, we, we, we are a wealthy economy. And so when you look at kind of how uh, consumption has shifted in the U.S. Um, over time, as, as wealth increases, you increase your consumption of higher value added products. Um, you know, we, we have TVs. We, we all have them. Um, we're not going to buy a lot more of them as our income increases. What will happen is we will shift towards services uh, in our consumption as, as our income increases. And since we are a relatively wealthy economy, the shift towards services is more advanced here than elsewhere. Uh, but I don't think the services are, are, are going away and, and many of the services can be provided remotely. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that if you are thinking about professional services, for example, um, the vast majority of them can be provided, um, uh, you know, through some sort of telepresence. Um, you know, you don't need, I don't need to stand in front of a podium to talk to the, the Newton County Chamber of Commerce. I can provide, you know, that service remotely. Um, there are some services to be sure where that just doesn't work. Um, you know, kind of hands-on services um, are by their nature hands-on. And mm -hmm. those are gonna be in the same situation as hospitality uh, where, you know, you're, you're just gonna have to wait for, for some sort of remedy for the, for the pandemic. But, but in general, um, it's not obvious why a, a service-dominated economy uh, that got that way because the fundamental economy is relatively wealthy um, is, is um, at any kind of major disadvantage um, com compared to others. I mean, I, I, and thinking about this globally, when you think about the economies that are really dominated by manufacturing, they've had severe problems. I mean, India's downturn in, in their economy is much worse th than ours. Um, and that's just, you know, a function of supply chain disruption and uncertainty. Um, and so there's, there's much more vulnerability there. Okay. Okay. And, you know, segueing a little bit, I, I'll try to keep it at two more, two and a half, perhaps, and then we'll let, we'll let you get yeah. on with your day um, <laughs> and those who are on that call. But um, sticking with um, services and kind of segueing into professional services, Tom, um, one um, participant asked, do you see an increase in professional development and or business training needs as that can be done remotely? Um, if so, what seems to be the highest demand for people who might be using their time now to develop themselves professionally or for managers to develop their, their staff? Um, if you're asking kind of what forms of training are most needed obviously uh, applied technology mm -hmm. is is okay. kind of the biggest and beyond that it is idiosyncratic uh with the industry but one of the you know big things we've been seeing in terms of growth industries are particularly in the business professions those um professions that need continuing education that's all being done online the, the kind of big conferences where you get, you know, your 40 hours of CPE credit because, you know, you're, you're going to, um, you know, the Marriott Marquis and, and spending three days, you know, listening to, to people like me talk. Um, that, that's not happening. Uh, what is happening is that online uh, professional development is, is really taking over. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, Again, that's, that's one of those things that I think uh, supports the idea that stuff is being pulled forward. That for a lot of businesses, things like college degrees um, are not nearly as important as keeping up with the, the kind of leading edge of the profession. Right. And that's much easier to do online than it is in person. And again, that's one of those things where, you know, I, I, a good example is my son. My son is in IT in a manufacturing uh, mm -hmm. setting. And, you know, basically there, 
he's, he's only been with this firm for three years and what he does now does not in any way resemble what he does when he started because the technology is continuously changing. You don't learn about that, you know, by, by attending a classroom, you learn about that online. And I think yeah. that process is being amplified now um, and spreading across um, all kinds of, of professions. Mm -hmm. And that's a superb example of a profession that is ever changing. I know a few folks in that industry and it's, you, you never uh, leave with the same credentials you came in under. Um, yeah. And, you know, Kenneth Shriver of Southern Company shared with us a couple months back when he was speaking to the economy as it stood at that moment is that crises such as this push emerging trends to the forefront. Yeah. Um, whether that's in the service industry or that's whether that's people finally ripping that band-aid and getting used to hitting the virtual classroom, so to speak. Maybe they were intimidated by it before. Um, so it seems that the general consensus is that these trends might stick with us. They might persist. And, and let me offer something, putting my Chamber of Commerce hat on here that, that I mm -hmm. think matters for you all. Um, you know, there has been this idea in both Silicon Valley and New York that, you know, if you want to start a high tech enterprise, it's hard to beat Silicon Valley or, or mm -hmm. um, you know, Tech Alley in, in, in Manhattan. But they're terrible places to scale businesses that succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of businesses that have seen slowdowns that are now kind of coming out and, and uh, picking up speed again are making very serious decisions to not make investments in San Jose or Manhattan um, because the, you know you know that you're not going to scale there you're going to scale in Atlanta or you know one of our competing cities and so you know as you're starting to reemerge from the pandemic. It just doesn't make any sense to try and build up a staff now or an investment now that you're going to move in two years. Uh, of course, yeah. And and so you know, like our economic development team is seeing all kinds of interest in uh, scaling firms relocating to uh, to the metro area, and the metro area again is this 29 county area that, that you know a lot of firms. Uh, need a lot of different characteristics and um, that's that's what the metro area has to offer in, in terms of lifestyle locational choices. Um, and I think that's again something that's going to benefit us um, pretty dramatically over the next year. Sure okay so bringing it back to um, emerging trends and workforce uh, Amazon is about to open its first robotics fulfillment center in Gwinnett County. Do you see the use of robotics increasing in industries like this to help to combat, if you will, or mitigate uh, workforce issues or shortages? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's just kind of no way around that, that when you look at productivity gains in, in you know, our economy, overwhelmingly they're in um, kind of areas that can be automated and and that's where you're, you're getting the, the returns um, you know we've known that this is gonna you know the kind of robot warehouses are, are were things that were gonna you know come to fruition eventually uh, now you you really need to see it happen and in something like logistics where you know, six months ago, logistics firms just couldn't get workers. Um, that that there were really dramatic shortages of um, both skilled and unskilled workers ac across the board. Um, you know, looking forward, it makes an enormous amount of sense for the firms that are opening new facilities to do it with that long-term labor shortage problem in mind. And so, yeah, I think we're going to see uh, robotics, you know, kind of all over the place. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And last, but most certainly not least, I'm going to combine two questions in one for you. 
uh, when you think about the recovery and what that might look like, what gives you heartburn, if anything? What causes it? Well, I think um, the lack of coherent guidance from um, authorities, let's put it that way. But I, I, I think, um, you know, this is just kind of a mess that, that um, you know, politics has entered a lot of things that um, where it's not making a positive contribution. And, um, you know, some things certainly are the political pressure to, to kind of expedite, um, you know, um, uh, vaccine trials is, is probably a good thing. Um, but some of it isn't as well. And, uh, and you know, it's very easy to make um, um, ill-tempered uh, decisions. Uh, or, and, and that's, you know, that's something that, that, is, uh, that, that is troubling. I, I do think that, um, I believe this gets attributed to Churchill a lot, but I don't think, it, I, I don't think that's right. But the, the saying is that, you know, you can count on Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I think that may be kind of where we are, sort of. I mean, where there's a lot of, you know, uh, divisiveness out there. And I'm not terribly um, worried about the longer term prospects for the U.S. I think fundamentally we're, you know, we're in pretty good shape. Um, you know, the near term is just kind of a mess. And, and uh, again, we're, this is something that we've never seen before. So maybe we should cut ourselves a little bit of slack. Um, we don't, how to put this? When, when I first came out of, of uh, the university, I taught. And one of the things I always said, I wanted to do but never did was on a test put a question where there isn't an answer uh, because those are really the interesting questions and they're the questions that are really hard obviously because we don't have an answer but but that's kind of where we are now and and people have kind of gotten used to the idea that there is an answer um, and and eventually we'll find it I mean that that's not in some sense wrong but, but we really are confronted with a very new situation here that we haven't seen before. Um, I mean, we've seen some potential for pandemic in the past, but this really did hit globally and, and pretty much all at once. And that just hasn't happened for over a century. Um, uh -huh. so, so, you know, um, I think we're in some sense expecting too much. Um, mm. and, and the idea that we're going to be able to come up with solutions instantly that can solve all problems. Um, and this, this one's a big problem and it's not easily solved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just for some uh, uh, clarification, and because I'm a bit of a quote nerd, um, Winston Churchill did take that quote and build upon it. It was actually an Israeli uh, politician and diplomat who has the earliest cited uh, statement that said, uh, men and nations behave wisely when they have exhausted all other resources. <laughs> so that seems yeah. to be the origin of that quote, so you were correct. Um, ding, 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 but to anyone who was curious. Um, so I think that's it for our questions. Um, Candice, if you are still around, I'd like to turn it back over to you um, to share your thoughts and to close out the program. Well, first of all, Tom, I think everything you have to say is fascinating and we so greatly appreciate it. It's, it's, um, we'll have you back. We can see how accurate you are if we have you back, right? Okay, fine and dandy. 
Um, but thank you for sharing. Um, we are very appreciative. I failed in the beginning to announce our sponsor for our Back to Business series, but I have to say, and you'll be seeing everybody this in your emails and information, we are so very grateful to Delta Community Credit Union for being our Back to Business sponsor and um, looking forward to some exciting programming they're going to help us bring to everybody. So I think that's it. We have a big uh, event tomorrow. Um, we are doing our drive up state of education lunch if you haven't made your reservation and we will be hearing from our new school superintendent the new president for the university of west georgia and the president of um, west georgia technical college and we also have a surprise guest our recently retired school superintendent dr barker will be with us and we'll be recognizing him so for those of you that don't know what a drive up event is you'll drive into the parking lot uh, somebody will hand you a boxed lunch. You'll find a parking place, which is socially distanced from the other cars. And then you'll tune into your radio frequency to hear the program or feel free to bring your stadium chair and sit out under the hot sweltering sun. So we <laughs> should have fun. Um, we're excited about this, but please, if you haven't made your reservation, get with Susan or Valerie. And Tom, again, thank you so very, very much. We are excited um, that you are part of this series. And for the rest of you, have a great day and we'll see most of you tomorrow. Bye.